and then I sell all the rights to Netflix and we, 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 we turn this into a catch me if you can. This story is about a watch blogger who had an AP stolen in every continent of the world on his journey to a half a million dollar Ulta Fire Uplo, which is the most pointless exercise ever. And then at the very last scene of the movie is me dropping that watch on the hard floor and just shattering it a million pieces. <laughs> the end. Fin. On this week's show, we swap cues for watches for cues just to see in the window and look at watches. We swap Ariel for Ripley, swap a collection of APs for one Hublot, and swap logos for no logos. Enjoy the show! Greetings and welcome to this week's A Blog to Watch Weekly. Ariel, well, we're not quite sure where Ariel is. We think he's back home. If he is, I suspect he's dog tired. So instead of Ariel, although you never know, he may turn up halfway through the show. We're missing Ariel. We still have David. Good morning, David. Isn't that a trade-off? Uh, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I made it. I don't know where Ariel is, probably passed out from his long way back home from freaking Geneva. But here I am, all rested and ready. Good, good. And my favourite seller since Peter, Ripley Sellers, our, what's your title? Your editor at large? Editor? Dog's body? Man running around town in Geneva? Man with the swag. All of it, all all of the above. Yeah, no, I, I, I uh, <laughs> but 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 still in Los Angeles. So uh, yeah, all of the above, but local. Good, good. Now both of you had good stories of getting to Geneva, but we don't really have time to cover them again. Did both of you get home without any incident? Yeah, I sure did. Thank goodness. Good, good. And were you sufficiently laden with swag from the show? Journalists like a good bit of swag. It's not that I like a good bit of swag. It's my family does, you know, friends and family. It's like <laughs> everything I receive, well, basically like 85, 90% of the stuff just go gets a new home right away after I get home. You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so that's what, but I'm happy to do that because it's like these things are, are, are precious for those who are not in the industry. I mean, we, you know, some of us had at least a number of years to get used to this, you know, stuff. And for us, it's like, oh, okay, great. Another tote bag for like the one hundredth gazillion time. Yeah. But for others, it's like, oh, you know, I'm the biggest like Tudor fan or whatever. And then it goes there and it finds a great new home and, and, and it's valued. I'm actually, I just moved house not too long ago and I realized one third of my, all my personal belongings are swag, <laughs> swag basically that I didn't want to like throw out and still looking for a new home. So I still have to sort that out. Ripley, swag of the show for you. What was the best bit of swag you saw? Oh, well, I mean, big, big shout out to that Eberhard umbrella, which absolutely <laughs> have saved multiple members. I, I had an event with Eberhard on like my first or second night there after the show kicked off. The umbrella was part of the swag bag and that that was just a staple throughout the rest of the week. And then when I was leaving Geneva, I willed it on to Jake and he got use out of it because we got nothing but rain after there after I departed. So, I mean, that might have been the most useful one. But in terms of my personal enjoyment, um, I very much appreciate the rest of the Blog to Watch team for grabbing me that uh, Rolex bag with the uh, fluted bezel chocolates. I mean, that's something I've always wanted to try. So had some uh, family and friends over, you know, share the chocolates, have some champagne and uh, try something, you know, one of those weird things that exists uh, once a year when they uh, decide to release new watches. And did you charge them 90 euros to enter the house? No, 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 absolutely. This is, uh, I, I, I like to have a very inclusive approach and, uh, you know, no one has to book an appointment in advance. It's, we're, we're just here to have fun. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think there are elements from Geneva and from Watch and Wonders that we should incorporate into our own life, like making appointments for everything. You can come and see me, but only when you've got an appointment. And it's a different <laughs> appointment if you want to touch. Like, that's a touch and feel that's appointment. Right. <laughs> it goes into a different category. <laughs> yes, Ripley is joining the show and has already introduced the touch and feel appointment into a blog to watch weekly. Thank you for lowering the tone, Ripley. That was good. Well, I'm not the one who came up with that term. That's a that's a long standing <laughs> designation as per the brand's official literature. I am simply abiding yes. by the verbiage outlined in it. <laughs> good stuff. Well, lots to talk about. David and I spent most of the week at Watch and Wonders. Ripley, you spent most of the week in and around Geneva. So we can compare and contrast some of the experiences and watches we saw from both shows. So let's crack on. So first up, Ripley, a bit of crosstalk. 
your observation of everything that was at Watches and Wonders, sitting on the outside, looking at all the blog to watch coverage and speaking to everybody that was at the show, what were your highlights of what you saw from an online perspective? Well, not looking at the Pal Expo releases and only looking at the stuff that debuted outside of that specific event, it was a really interesting kind of compare and contrast to see what a very specific uh, sector of brands, because Watches and Wonders Geneva isn't for all brands. There's certain brands that are very comfortable in terms of scale and price point, but that it just doesn't make sense for them to debut at the same show with, you know, the likes of like Rolex and Patek Philippe. So, you know, those brands, some of those brands might be at time to watches other brands that kind of have that cult following that really does you know, know their retailer demographic and the journalists that want to cover them. They might be debuting at other locations around it. So it was really interesting to get that contrast compared against what is a very specific kind of sector of brands from all across the industry that actually debut at the show. Honestly, I, I love the gig I had for this specific trip because aside from better bathroom situations and kind of a more relaxed pace, <laughs> I got to see a bunch of interesting watches from some of those like high scale independent manufacturers where they might be releasing a single or double digit quantity that year that other than at this specific event during that week in Geneva, I'll probably never get a chance to see again. In the interviews that I did before, watches and wonders with a number of the brands which you can find on the spending time channel or if you search for blog to watch weekly on youtube you can find there a, a number of those brands that were displaying off-site in the hotels communicated to me that actually it wasn't really part of their plan to exhibit at hotels at all but they kept on getting phone calls from everybody else that was going to watch and wonders that was going to time to watches asking well what are you guys doing and the response was well we're doing nothing so eventually they were like actually we're gonna have to do something we're gonna have to pitch up somewhere so that all of these customers retailers that are coming to see everybody else can actually handily come to see us mm. so they would pitch up on hotel brands like Morris Lacroix or Doxa who would normally be a kind of Geneva watch weeks or or sometime later in the year that has some serious too cool for school vibe to me it's like oh we're so popular people were asking for us all the time it's like, <laughs> just like okay <laughs> you know and then finally we gave in and we were like all right we'll come and then <laughs> if you insist we'll come and yeah hire an entire hotel or an entire suite so you can come and see us so ripley highlights of watches you actually saw um i mean on the high side of, of things you gotta give uh some that our time piece it, i mean it's kind of like the dream team of watchmakers with the very impressive resumes all coming together to make a very cool piece in a very small quantity that thing is fantastic and i mean it was so fantastic even though i had a scheduled 30 minute meeting the you know the way that piece i mean that the whole room was with one watch in it so i probably got about 90 seconds took as many shots as i could but that piece actually is very stunning the hyt green tourbillon with the, the little globes filled with liquid and you know that under black lights fantastic i mean that that piece is cool itself but then on the low you know the affordable side as, as, as well you get some very interesting pieces from uh, a number of bit brands and you know like take your pick depending on the style one of the more interesting ones was this uh like the argon watch it, it kind of has like debethun vibes kind of like a rocket ship on the wrist you get steel titanium or carbon fiber but we're talking like an under two grand price point so if you have aspirations of that two thousand dollar blue meteorite debethun but don't necessarily have six figures to blow on it um i thought that that was kind of a really cool and unexpected one and it's uh kind of the same family of uh, nevada grinch and so it's uh kind of a known quantity as far as the production side and you know delivery and all of that you mentioned our Argon watches, yeah, this is from, is it Guilhem Lade or Ladette, who also owns Vulcane, Nevada Grinch, and this is his kind of specialist watch release in partnership. I'm trying to think what the name of the chap is it's he partnered with to do I this. I believe they're French. I, 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 I'm like, yeah, forgive me for not having these details. It wasn't even on the schedule. We were, it, you know, there's like it, half a dozen to 
10 brands all in this one little space. And we, you know, met with as many as we could just kind of making the rounds of those that, but like, I didn't even, they weren't even on the schedule, but we sat down, someone was finishing up next to us at Nevada. So we, you know, we, we spoke to them for a hot second, very impressed by the pieces, but I mean, that goes for a number of those kind of small scale brands, even Bossell, that like Australian ish brand. So much of the releases that I've actually seen in the press that they've actually sent us have been watches that weren't necessarily their specific design DNA as far as the brand themselves. It was kind of interesting to see those same models adapted when it wasn't a collaboration piece and more in something of the spirit of their own brand. And again, that's, you know, very much on the more affordable side of the spectrum. You can listen to an interview with Guillaume from Volcano Nevada Grinch and Argon on the Spending the Time channel. Go and check that out. Uh, David, now that you have reflected a little bit, being back home, if you've actually had a chance to reflect on anything, uh, what is your impressions of, of the week as a whole at PAL Expo? It was more relaxed than I, I remembered from previous years. Somehow uh, it is as though, and perhaps this is a, you know, a reflection on myself, but it is as though everyone has aged <laughs> and become that much more, <laughs> not the ladies, obviously, but everyone else. And, you know, it's like <laughs> every, everything has become like much more relaxed and more chill than it used to be some previous year. It used to be much more, you know, just way more hectic than it was this year. It was still, you know, uh, um, an energetic place to be for sure. But at the same time, the booths were like you know, just much more simple than it used to be, more, you know, budget friendly, uh, noticeably and across the board for everybody this is true um and which was also a big change you know it's like five years ago pre-covid i remember every booth was like more crazier than the other and i think you know the brakes might have been applied a bit too much this year and um i think the race will begin next year who will want to stand out from this crowd of uh, mediocre booths and, and just create more of a vibe because i think that matters i mean it's one time a year and i understand that the expense is huge but then again these brands thrive on image and and you know some of these booths were nothing crazy to write home about and um i saw people i i went actually on sunday just before my flight i went to the public day and i saw people flocking in and that era, um, allowed me to look at this through their lens like huh what would it be like if i paid like 80 strings or however much that was and I, I maintain my opinion that I think it's great to go there once as a sort of a pilgrimage and be close to these brands and this event. But the way the booths were, I wouldn't want me to go back next year and look at the craziness, you know? If they were like five years ago, I would go every single year because it was, it was, it was crazy. And so how were the pub, how was the public day going? Was there lots of queues? Was it very busy? I wanted to know things like, during the press days, all the food is free, all the drink is free. You sit down, somebody yeah. will offer you a coffee. Was it still that? Was that still the format? I would hope that still was the format for 90 Swiss franc entry. Here's the thing. People could get the full Rolex experience in the sense that outside the Rolex booth, and you are not going to believe it, a queue, but with like those, <laughs> those little like when they they when they manage the crowd and you queue in S's basically, uh, I don't even know what they, what they are like, is what they're called. So people were lining up there to be. It was sort of like a religious experience in a way that they could enter at one end and leave at the other. So they had like maybe. 200 feet, maybe, I mean, no, not even that, like 150 uh -huh. feet inside the Rolex booth <laughs> on the ground floor, like enter at one end and leave at the other and maybe get a bag in between. And I was like, wow, like the power of, of some of these brands is crazy. And uh, yeah, again, I don't recall there being anything in the Rolex booth. Nothing. Everything. Everything was outside in the window, was it not? <laughs> yeah, it's just like baptism. <laughs> you just go through there and, like, <laughs> and just come out the other end. <laughs> the, the, world, the world's most disappointing, like, you know, it's like one of those ghosts, you know, <laughs> those kind of fairgrounds that kind of pop up in car parks. Yes, it was. And, and they, like, have the the mystery like ghost train or something which turns out is you just walk through a couple of halls of mirrors and then you pop out the other side yeah. back into the car park <laughs> yeah <laughs> i just imagine folk are walking through the rolex boutique and they come out and they've got a bag with some chocolate in it yes uh, i mean yeah 
It, it, and that's not fair on the fairground experience, honestly. But uh, <laughs> but at least what you, with the receipt you get after the fairground, you cannot flip on eBay. I'm sure many of these bags and, and other nonsense ends up on, ends up there, uh, which is just sad. But at the same time, it was it was fun to see that you know people want to go there. And of course, you know if I if I paid that much money, I I would want yeah. to go through the booth as well. And it's a fun experience in the sense that this is as close as you can get to being in Rolex. Mm. outside of a boutique or, or you know when you're not in a boutique so so that was interesting but um yeah to answer your question yeah the the, the food you have to pay for uh the drinks you have to pay for unless you're in the pl- press lounge which is uh, of course monitored so yeah, that's where that's where you go um yeah the queues were, were were very fascinating it was really slow i was there by like 8 30 before 9 a.m i was already there and it was basically empty and people started coming in crowds by about 11, 11 30, And that's where it really got out right. of hand. So the early advisors, you know, had like easy access to basically everything. Now, I, I, I do want to know whether they like, like fairgrounds, you know, next year they'll introduce the fast pass. Mm. You could pay a little extra to jump the queue <laughs> to get into the Rolex boutique. You get a, you get a, 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 a different colored band around your wrist. Anyway, I, well, Ariel's not here, so we'll not touch on the full experience until next week. But David, I don't suppose you happen to observe uh, what was happening with the public as they tried to get onto the Chanel stand. Well, um, with the public? Because there is a story we'll tell next week about Ariel's experience on the Chanel stand. Oh, yeah. Uh, you got to hear that. We'll give this... We'll give the start of it, but we'll let Ariel tell it for full. It's going to be worth tuning in for next week, believe me. But basically, when we got to the Chanel stand, you know, all the journalists, or a large number of the journalists, me included, have got roller bags with us because it's full of gear. In my case, recording gear. In <laughs> oh, your that's case, what you mean. camera gear. Yeah. Well, no, I mean the other thing as well, the thing that we're not going to touch on till next week. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's worth the story. But the first bit of that was. Ariel, by that stage on the Friday, was the only one with a bag. Ours had all been checked in elsewhere. And Ariel gets on the stand as he kind of saunters on the way that Ariel does with his roller trolley, only to be greeted by the flat palm hand of Chanel saying, you will go no further with that bag. Because it was a roller bag and they had a nice white carpet, they were uber concerned about the wheels having picked up any sort of dirt and leaving, you know, a big trail of destruction across their white carpet. So they lifted it carefully, gave them a ticket and checked it into the back. I just want to know how they managed to prevent uh, all of the day trippers, you know, dragging the mud in from the airport straight from the street, especially as it had been raining, unlike the other day. <laughs> Here's the twist. The Chanel booth is like a mile into the, the show. So you, you will have to roll your freaking bag at least a mile before you get there. And here's the other thing. <laughs> the carpet there had this, like, 1980s American shoe store carpet vibe. It wasn't even that nice. <laughs> it, 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 I was, I was even like, imagine asking Al Bundy to lift his, like, bag when he's rolling through. Like, if it was, like, a nice bit of carpet or something, I would have been like, okay. And it was, like, day six. So it was totally not the, It was just the luxury experience, you know, to feel like, a, a, you know, to, to feel part of it. That, oh, you're not even, you're barely worthy as a human being to step on it. But your roller bag, uh-uh, no way. <laughs> uh, Ripley, did you come across any slightly excessive uh, treatments at any of the booths in uh, uh, Time to Watches or elsewhere in hotels? Like, like Ariel will tell his story next week from Chanel as to what happened next. <laughs> no, not slightly excessive treatments. Uh, thoroughly impressed by some of the more off-site, like th- those that weren't just exhibiting within you know, uh, you know, like a hotel somewhere, some of the further offsite things, I was thoroughly impressed, you know, Gucci had a whole estate thing set up. And uh, the Custos Frank Mueller, I mean, over there by like watch land, that's a whole compound of watch, you know, a restaurant and a bar and more like 50 tourbillons on display. So I mean, I was more impressed by some of that, but excessive treatment, no. I mean, I think it was fairly tra- tame and uh, all things considered, a fairly measurable uh, appointment of uh, of swag and uh, pomp and circumstance. Good, good. Right, let's talk about some actual watches. Now, 
I assume you have both been tapped on the shoulder to already give a note of your favourites from the show. Uh, Ariel is obviously excluded from this because he doesn't believe in lists. David, why don't you give us give us your top three from what you saw in and around Watch and Wonders Geneva online? What were your three standouts from the from the week? Well, I I was just going through my pictures because every time I'm asked this question, I just go blank. I, I've seen, but I don't know how many watches, <laughs> and they remember virtually none of them, which is just crazy. It, it, it speaks volumes of those few watches that I do actually remember, and I'm not making this up. I have absolutely no recollection of the things I saw there. Uh, but <laughs> as I'm scrolling through my pictures, of which there are many, um, I see the utter ridiculousness, which is in the best way possible of Ublo. Uh, I just scroll and it's like one crazy nonsense, incredible watch after the other. I, I so appreciate that, you know. And again, we can mock Hublot for being as tasteless as it is, which it kind of is. But at the same time, it is so impressive to be able to manipulate this many different designs and materials and complications. Who does that? Nobody does that. Not even close. If you look at look back at this year. Um, so I, I, you know, that may might actually be worthy of an article unto itself. Like. How, which one? Who is the next brand who's actually second to Hublot when it comes to so many materials, so many designs, so many novel complications? You know, what? it's not. I'm not saying I like all of them, or basically I like very few of them. But still, I, I'm just impressed. So Hublot definitely one of the highlights for me as a brand, and within that, all the Sapphire. Um, watches and the bracelet even though and it is rare for me to like uh, get the calls or like whatever it's called you know like to, to be afraid of breaking a watch but when i had the sapphire bracelet on i was like this thing it's just bound to shatter even if i just look at it wrong um and yeah so that was kind of sketchy at half a million who knows how much that bracelet cost uh but it was still a lot of fun so that's that's basically my answer to your question the other two who knows so, Hublot, I was so impressed with the biaxial retrograde. Retrograde seemed to be a big theme of the show. Lots of retrograde watches, yeah. Vacheron, Hublot. There were a few others in there, but the biaxial retrograde uh, tourbillon was definitely a, a favourite of mine. Uh, so, other brands, David, that jumped out at you? You know, what's funny about the, the retrograde you mentioned, that is the only watch in the lineup that... Uh, that looks like it was designed 10 years ago. Uh, I think they found that at the bottom <laughs> of a drawer or something like, oh my God, I, oh, a tremendous expense would develop this crazy bias and bias or two be over the retrograde and they've done nothing with it. <laughs> and then they just like, that watch has very serious early 2010s vibes. Very, very serious. I, when I looked at it, I was like, whoa, what, like, what, what, did they forget to launch this or something like that? And you know, that's my hunch, but I think that that's what it is. I like Chopar very much. Uh, there's an 8 hertz Alpine Eagle. It is as though the Alpine Eagle was not tempting enough for me already, which it already had been. Now there's an 8 hertz version of it, which is just over the top for me. So that, that is just, just fantastic. So Chopard is number two. Yeah. So this is the Chopard Alpine Eagle Cadence 8HF, which is their 8 hertz watch. Mm -hmm. It's got a nice touch of orange in it, which I really liked. Uh, Chopard was a good booth. Final choice. So you Hublot, Chopard um that's a really good question you see who knows i like some louis moine stuff very much i you know I, I put put on one of these smaller chronographs that had an orange strap and some numbers on it and an open worked dial in a sense that you could see a lot of the parts for the for the uh, chronograph mechanism and i thought to myself wow this is really nice with a box crystal curved box crystal and i thought to myself this is right up my alley i don't even know what it was called it's basically a numbered edition of a chronograph from Louis Monet and I remember putting it on and I was like wow this is this is a very impressive product all around. Yeah Louis Monet last year was particularly impressive I didn't actually get the chance to visit them this year though I did see the watch in the windows I and I found them last year that they were really surprising in that looking at them on the website just not for me but see in the booth trying them on they were phenomenal watches. Uh, the tight, I think it was the time to race ones last That's year. That's exactly what it is. Big, with the big numbers on them. I think they were also yes. one of the highlights this year. Uh, just incredibly comfortable chronographs. Just really, really cool. Once you had them on, you're like, oh, I actually really like this. I, I could see myself in one of these. It was really weird. And the stand were so friendly. Mm. 
always a really friendly place to go, always greeted uh, really nicely at Louis Monet. You are absolutely correct. It's a time to race. I looked it up in the meantime. It's like 30,000, it's right. So it's not cheap by any stretch of the imagination, no. but, but the mechanical complexity that you get to experience through the dial and the overall execution was just spot on. So it's well done. Yeah, so Ripley, the favorite three brands you visited during your sojourn in Geneva? Oh, wow, that's a tough one. I mean, um, Kustos was really cool. I uh, I had I had never experienced their watches in person before, and I got to experience a ton of them, and was just really impressed by kind of what they can do and kind of where they're headed when you kind of see past, present, and future all at once. Spell that for the listeners. CVS. T O S. And you're pronouncing it as if it's a U. Yeah, Kustos. I think it's kind of one of those Bulgari things. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I would have, uh, I would have, I would have just said the letters, but after hearing enough of them talk about it in the Kustos format, I'm, uh, I'm going with that. But yeah, I was very interested in kind of what they're doing on kind of the very much more modern, and obviously those art time pieces are worth keeping an eye out for because you know whatever the follow-up piece is is going to be thoroughly impressive so kustos is the kind of richard meal-esque that kind of tonneau k-shape how does it stack up against a richard meal so i i it's a totally different price point the entry level for that brand is just under 10k and it tops out at around like the quarter million mark for like i mean and that's talking about like full sapphire multiple tourbillon like whole whole thing over there um but for some of their more straightforward models we're talking you know tens not hundreds of thousands of dollars and it kind of scratches a similar itch and it's kind of one of those brands that probably isn't on a lot of the radar which is otherwise a market dominated by like six figure pieces from either hublot jacob and co or you know richard meal and is is it that price because that's really the price that a Richard Mill should be charging, but they just charge excessive amounts more, or is it an entirely different quality of finishing, entirely different movement architecture? Compare and contrast the Custos and what you get bang for buck versus the Richard Mill at ten times the price that looks kind of similar. One of the big sides is when it comes to the movements, Gustos does have their own movements that they're starting to kind of dig their teeth into. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how that evolves. But for some of the models, it'll be basically like a 7750. But as they described it, they're kind of like the AMG. Do, they do what like an AMG tweak would be to like what would be a regular mercedes engine so is it on a you know built upon the 7750 architecture absolutely is it kind of it expressed in a more colorful and interesting rendition uh, yes as well so you know i think but that's also how you're able to get you know a sapphire cased full sapphire case chronograph at like forty thousand versus you know four hundred thousand or more I, I think the big differentiating factor is the movements, but again, this is a brand where relative to, you know, some of the companies that have been kicking around for hundreds of years, this is one where I think their own in-house movements could unlock a really interesting potential. And since they sort of are doing a lot of the same things at a different price point, this could be really an interesting brand to watch kind of in that highly avant-garde modern material space that isn't necessarily six figures right off the bat. Yeah, they have the Sea liner collection, which is probably the closest thing to, that looks a bit Richard Mule like but is also quite simple and straightforward. Generally a three-hander movement. I think there's some chronographs and some more complicated in there, but so go and check out the other two worth a mention is, you know, Gucci, we usually think of Gucci doing watches like fairly affordable relative to like you think of Gucci's uh, like loafers in regards to regular loafers. They're very much a premium product. And that hasn't always been true for the timepieces. A lot of what I saw is very high complication pieces, uh, you know, high level gem setting, um, you know, six figures and up, you know, wandering hours, sapphire cases. Um, they're really trying to assert themselves in a more upmarket position. 
And then um, on the other side of things, Beauvais, I saw a wealth of interesting watches at Beauvais. You know, what an interesting brand. Obviously, they kind of operate within a very specific space, but, you know, they make dials made out of sugar crystals kind of put together in a marquetry pattern. So it's a... They do some really interesting stuff outside of just those very high complication, you know, quasi-skeleton pieces we often think of. Yeah, no, Beauvais are certainly worth checking out. Gucci, I think, is an interesting one. They're obviously, it feels like they're playing catch up with the other fashion houses that have got into watches. It will be interesting to see if they're playing catch up a bit too late, if it's just they've missed the boat in terms of getting themselves... Uh, into the watch game and and being accepted first of all as a watchmaker rather than as a fashion house just trying to brand up something but certainly some interesting watches you mentioned our time uh, this is an interesting brand and the one watch they've got in the go is a kind of skeleton dial timepiece it's, it's got some ap vibes to it presumably because of the people who are involved in it so you've got five or six people that have kind of come together for this brand our time did you actually meet any of the people involved with it ripley i did a couple but this is one of those watches where like the, the whole room that they had at the hotel there's one watch in it and it you know, you could have an appointment or not, it's going to get bombarded by people just kind of wanting to go see it. It's immaculately done in every which way. The It has a function, function selector uh, kind of, you know, RM adjacent where you can switch between, you know, time setting, winding in a neutral position. Obviously, there's a very prominent tourbillon. But you know, this is one of those watches where the movement and the case, it's not one thing inside the other. It's all conceived to be one collective piece when assembled. And so it's not like there's a main plate for the movement. All the bridges are sort of suspended within this sapphire middle case on titanium. And yeah. it's there's a lot about it that feels very classical when you get it in hand and look at the finishing techniques. And when you look at the dream team of people on the project, it that makes sense. But it is an unapologetically modern design and what I believe to be the first of what you know, a number of different pieces from them. And, you know, it's hard not to be impressed by it when you see it in person and just see the total amount of thought that went into its construction, design, layout, and of course, finishing and execution. Yeah, I mean, you've got personalities that used to be at AP, Gribble Forcey, Renault Papi, uh, Tag, FP Jure, Minerva, all sorts of folk involved in this. I don't know to what extent the guys involved have given up doing what they're doing elsewhere and this is their own focus do you know ripley whether this is now what the five or six folk previous involved in these other high-end organizations is this now their gig or is this their side hustle do we know i mean i honestly don't know to what extent i i i can't imagine this is the only thing all of them are doing i mean it's a 20 watt they, they're they're making 20 of these so you know i can't imagine this is all of what they're doing or what or, or to what degree it's necessarily taking their attention but it, it's clearly a passion project and very much a collaboration in the uh in the full sense of the word and so this doesn't seem to be something where just a bunch of high profile people are slapping their name onto a generic design. It really is kind of a very special piece. And, um, you know, whether it's a passion project or one of their full time operations, there's clearly a lot of thought and effort going into it. And that's clear whether you just look at the finishing and execution or even just the way that it's designed and configured and again there's 20 yeah. of these things so the, the, it's not like they're cranking out uh thousands of these a year or anything like that yeah i mean it's a stunning watch put together by some stunning watchmakers with the most disappointing marketing branding on <laughs> the best looking watch of its type you've ever seen so they really should have added to their dream team somebody that knew something about marketing because our time and the logo and all of that, I'm sorry, it just, <laughs> they'd have been better without a brand on it. They'd have been better going the Moser route and just letting it speak for itself because the our time thing and logo with the wee mountain motif, well, uh, it just, just doesn't work. I don't know. What was it like in person? 
I, I, I mean, the, the, yeah, let, let, let's just separate the watch from its its name and the branding on it. But maybe it's one of those things like, you know, the financial services industry where you kind of expect their website to be remarkably underwhelming. And it should be because that's like not what they're good at. They're not a tech firm. They're here yeah. to do money. And that has barely changed over the years. So maybe it's one of those things where, of course, like – all of the effort, all of the thought, all of the consideration went into this remarkable product. And the branding is something where, you know, I feel like they could have just pulled three random consultants from any industry and ended up with <laughs> potentially a better name for the product. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming it's based on art time and they're trying to be all kind of funky and all the rest of it. But uh, yeah, just leave it alone, boys and girls. Just do so. Yeah. Here's it's the thing. Take the brand... Uh -huh. if, if if it's it's just not cool if you have to explain a brand name, you know, uh, unless it's yeah. like Jira Pera Go or Jira Liquid, where it's out of the question. No one's going to ask, like, what, what is that? No one's going to try and, and say it after you. But if you say our time, it could be like our time or art time or, or AR time or a bunch of other things. You know, like, so which one is it? You know, it's like <laughs> it's it, Jira Pera Go, you just hear that and you know you don't understand it. And, and it's cool, yeah. it's fancy, it's French, it's whatever. So they get a pass uh, because we are trained to give them a pass at this point. But, you know, I was just going to say at 195,000, I'm sure you can ask them to leave that little thing off or just send send it to you in, a, in an envelope or something and just have name bridges. <laughs> <laughs> I think that much customization is, is, is part of the deal for sure. They should just have asked second, second to, uh, you know, jump in with some... Have some him do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have him do it. It would have been fine. I mean, it's got Didier Breton's name on it. I'm not sure why so it's which one is it? art time. Didier Breton, who's the movement designer for it. So I'm a bit confused as to the branding, which makes it even worse. So they either should just have put... Breton on it or Breton or however you pronounce Didier's surname or you know there's a couple of guys some cool Fa Fabrice Deschanel you could put Deschanel on it that would have been cool yeah uh, who else have you got that's involved with it? E Eminger Claude you could just have put Claude on it that would have been fun <laughs> it would have sounded like it had been made by a by a clown uh, yeah Matrell Steph I don't know it could, anyway, it, it could just be an abbreviation you just call it ADB and then that's it you know, it's like, what's that? Oh, it's an ADB. Uh, you know, that sounds much better than the art time DD in Britain. You know, it's like, sure, that sounds cool, but no one's going to know what that is. A Rolex is part of, part of Rolex's success is that it's easy to remember and it sounds expensive. That's part of it. I mean, no one's going to buy one of 20 of this watch without knowing the individuals involved in it personally. Mm -hmm. So it really makes no difference if you put a brand on it. So they should just have left it off. I mean, the watch is stunning, but the, the branding looks like it's been done on some sort of Microsoft, you know, document and then just stuck on it. They'll get the hang of it eventually, for sure. They'll get the hang of it. I, 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 another three or four brands in. They'll do a Christopher <laughs> Ward. They'll take an initial in. out. <laughs> <laughs> they'll, they'll, t they'll take an initial out. They'll capitalize one. They'll make one lowercase. They'll do it three or four times, and then they'll just realize all oh, they need is a logo. So there you go. But best, best of luck to our time in that. Hi, I'm Thomas Bayo, the founder of Bayo Watches. My family has been living in the heart of the Swiss Watch Valley for generations, but I'm the first one to put our name on the dial. Today, Bayo is one of the best kept secrets here in Switzerland, adopted by many industry connoisseurs. When we released a 100% Swiss made stunning tourbillon for under 5,000 US dollars, the biggest regional newspaper came to investigate to see if this was possible. It is. We currently offer five model families and our prices start at 500 US dollars. I invite you to come and learn what industry experts know best. Authentic Swiss watchmaking. Visit BA111OD.com. Let's deal a little bit with some news. AP have announced that they are sort of going to insure your watch against theft. Have either of you seen this story on the AP website? Yes. Uh, what do we think? Is, is this... I mean, it's obviously real, but... <laughs> what is it doing it's, it's, it's good job they didn't launch it on the first of april you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, so basically what they're saying is if you buy an ap in 2022 or 2023 yeah and you go through the registration process if you damage it 
it appears to say that if you damage it yourself, like if you fall over in the ground and crack the crystal, so it's not a warranty job in that it's broken because it was badly manufactured, there was a fall. If you break it and you've gone through the process, they will cover the breakage. Either they'll fix it, give you a new watch or give you your money back. And if you get the watch stolen, so if it gets hacksawed off your wrist by a moped gang in the streets of London and they drive off with it into the distance, they will cover you, either give you your money back or replace the watch. I'm like, this is one of those things that sounds like a good idea to promote, but I'm not sure it is. I'm not sure it actually gives the message that they wanted to give of, oh great, we are, we really care about you, rather than, yeah, we know you're likely to get assaulted with this watch on, or actually they're quite delicate. If you fall over and break it, it's going to need fixed. Well... Yeah, it's about. It's just an odd one. It's just an odd. One. I mean, how many of these do they produce? They produce fifty thousand watches a year, mm. or or is it just a no brainer job? Like it happens to three watches a year, so they get a whole load of PR. We talk nicely about them, and actually, they never have to pay out in any of this because you'll never actually meet the bar of qualifying to get the watch covered. The problem is. Unless, and I've had a look, unless you've actually got an AP with the ability to activate from the serial number, you can't get through the login process to see what the small print is. Mm. So if anyone out there has done this and is willing to send us any small print that exists behind the scenes, we'd love to hear from you. Podcasts at a blog to watch dot com. I can look into that. I, 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 you know, I have access to that, but it's, uh, it's still funny to have to do that. Like, here's the good thing we're doing, and then oh, you, you have to like. Uh, Rip wait. Did you hear that humble brag? Dave is going to go to his drawer afterwards and just slide open the drawer full of APs and he's going to sort it out for us. Which oh, yeah. one should I take out? Of course, out? of course. David, David, which which one are you picking? I know you have options. So among the various <laughs> among the various serial numbers to choose, pick a winner, I guess. Pick one that will be well, a good you know, representation for our readers. Here's the thing. I, I've been hoarding 1159s because <laughs> they will become the icon 40 years from now so my grandchildren can go to college just by selling their granddad's 1159 collection. Uh, you know, the Royal Oak was well, not very well received at the beginning, so that, that's what I'm, I'm aiming for. Uh, in all seriousness, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird that it goes like that. Uh, the website actually says that in case of theft, the Mary Piguet will examine the request and will offer... Um, either replacement or a refund shall all the prerequisites be met um, yeah. <laughs> you know so what those are nobody knows but it sure sounds great I mean uh, AP has um, realized I think a one billion dollar turnover or something like that so they are sh shifting a billion dollars of watches per year all of which are basically uh, out there to be stolen so it's uh, <laughs> It's 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 quite a quite a stretch. We will see. Of course, you have to file a police report, uh, it, but then again, uh, who knows where 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 this leads to? And it also opens up the can of worms, which is the world of stolen watches and how they are handled in, but you know, by other brands and their official service networks. We should at some point talk about that because uh, I've heard all kinds of crazy stories. Well, where a watch gets turned in by somebody who's bought it used, he's maybe the tenth owner or whatever. And then it turns out that at some point in the past, the watch was stolen. So like in 2006 in Belgium, it was stolen and now it's with somebody which is somewhere. And the watch is not held back by the service centers most of the time. They are, they are handed back. And you do with that whatever you want. Maybe you go to the police and say, hey, I actually paid a bunch of money and, you know, please help me get it back or whatever else. So that the original owner 15 years in the past can get his watch back. How does that work? And so, again, this is a kind of worms, but it's definitely something we might want to look into. It's just uh, a wide scale of experiences. Yeah, I think that's really interesting because a number of the Rolex aside just because of the sheer volume and other organizations that can service them. But when you go to AP, Richard Mille, Patek, the real big brand watches that are susceptible to being stolen, if these things ever get serviced, then almost certainly AP, Richard Mille, Patek know about it because you ain't going to find, you know, 
standard parts anywhere or some sort of large network that can also service them in the way that there's lots of networks and lots of approved service centers. I'm assuming for Richard Mule that the only people that can service that watch is Richard Mule. So eventually, if you've reported a stolen watch to them, it might be 50 years from now, they're going to see it at some stage uh, or somebody's going to be asking for the parts for a serial numbered watch that uh, somebody realizes a number of years ago was actually involved as part of a thing. <laughs> I think it is a really interesting story. I, I mean, I do love what you've pointed out, which is the so long as the prerequisites are met. I mean, that's just a great line. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we'll do this so long as our prerequisites of it was stolen by someone in high-vis waistcoat. It was stolen while you were standing on your head. It was stolen on a cruise ship. I don't know, what are the prerequisites? Give us a clue. Like, don't just tease us. List some of the prereqs. It saves us having to make them up. Yeah, I, I wonder if I go to an AP boutique tomorrow and ask about this, I wonder if they can tell me all the prerequisites. I mean, most of these things, theft insurance or extended warranties and all the rest of them, we all know they have their pitfalls and, and all the rest of it. But I just I just find it funny, what I was just chuckling at is I, I imagine like the owners of AP uh, 50 years from now, I mean, the, of the brand itself, and they are like, oh, great, we just found the watch from a, half a century ago, so it's okay that we lost a gazillion billion dollars on, the, you know, insurance <laughs> back in the 2020s <laughs> when basically all our watches get stolen magically we had to make them twice essentially um <laughs> it's enough that funny right. every watch has an ear and a spare yeah well that's exactly what i'm thinking right <laughs> which is what what's to stop someone from being oh everyone you know wants to steal jumbo let me just tell them mine got nicked by some guy on a motor scooter they can, you know, <laughs> let me go pass it along to whatever. They can go file off or re-engrave a serial number. I get supplied a new one because, God, they're not going to refund me the money for it. It would be cheaper for them to just give me a new steel watch. And then, you know, what's to stop? All of, is, all of a sudden, are we just going to have like a wealth of, um, you know, random shoddy ser en engraved uh, serial numbers or, you know, I, I don't know. I think this can be somewhat of a can of worms, but like you said, it's, if the criteria is met or whatever, if the prerequisites are met, that could be a very stringent list of things. It must have been on a Tuesday on the third week of the month, provided that you took a recent shot of the date that on your phone. And, you know, who knows? That's right. It's, a, it's like a, it's like one of those uh, kidnap things where you have to send a photo of your watch with today's newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to, to APHQ. Like, I'm still wearing it. I got it. <laughs> I, I proved that I had it yesterday because here it is. You have to, you have to like have a record of showing you had it every day. But you're right. I mean, what, what is to stop somebody? I mean, it's well known that some people in the watch community are not necessarily the straightest shooters. So what, what is to stop someone, as you say, saying, "Yeah, my watch got nicked. I've uh, here's here's the police report. Here's the crime number. Dear AP, can I have a new watch, please?" And now you've got. Two APs. I don't get it. Well, here's the thing. I mean, I, I heard this story very recently. Uh, 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 and not even a friend, an acquaintance of mine uh, told me this. He's purchased a bunch of Rolexes over the course of the year. And someone was asking really nicely. And he, you know, made the mistake of lending his his really nice Rolex uh, to them. And actually not even to them, but to, they actually pass it on to somebody else. And that somebody else had the watch and you know they already had one you know in order or whatever else and and you know like a month goes by or maybe for six weeks and the original owner of the watch receives a call from the rolex boutique saying asking him if he still has that fancy watch that he bought from them which is a high demand watch and he goes well i believe i do um sure and they're like well why then why is it for sale in in vienna at a you know used <laughs> store and he was like at a pre-owned watch store and he was like what <laughs> and and, it, and his watch you know made the rounds and ended up with somebody who actually flipped that and and just went to do like some store and just handed it in there like a pawn shop pawned it basically that's the word and Within days of that happening, I don't know how, he received a call from the AD where he purchased that watch asking if he still has it. 
which raises a number of questions, which is it's mm. insane that they monitor the, the system like that. And then you receive a call asking. So whoever is saying that all these watches are being flipped and are being sold to France, that's totally not true. You actually get questioned by the AD, what happened to your watch? And this is how he got his watch back, because he called the pawn shop and he asked if his watch was there, and he got in his car, and he went there, and he picked it up right away. But he met, And he wished them good luck getting their money back or whatever they paid for the guy who, who pawned it. I think uh, one of the things that I noticed, and there's an interview coming up at some point that we recorded at Watch and Wonders with eBay, is the extent to which, and speaking to a number of brands, the extent to which the brands themselves have full departments and teams of people that scour the internet for watches that are being moved on either that shouldn't be well shouldn't's the wrong word either that have just been recently sold to their first owner or are potentially clones or fakes or franken watches you know we spent time i spent time with five or six brands in conversations whereby it was clear they had full teams that that is what they spend their day doing they spend their day going on to chrono 24 and ebay and all sorts of other places pawn shops local international ones that they know have reputations looking for goods that could damage their brand and damage their bottom line frankly if they got moved on so they really are paying attention and it's ever more clear that the retailers are having to get involved in speaking to the brands in terms of of what's being passed through their system as well other content you can find from their blog to watch team obviously on the website there is oodles of coverage from everything that's been going on in geneva in the last week you will also find extensive interviews on the spending time channel we may drop in one or two snippets uh, on this show this week uh, from some of the interviews that will be appearing on Spending Time you'll certainly hear some of not quite the outtakes but some of the the material we have not quite used, not had time to use. Uh, we did a bit of a window shop, myself and Ariel at the Patek booth. There's some recordings from Bulgari that involve Ed that are quite good and we did in fact play one game that we're going to try and play with Ripley uh, and David today. Ripley, you were on an international flight home. Did you watch any in-flight movies? Uh, I, I did. Oh, my God. Yeah, I did. I watch a lot of movies. Yeah, I, I had a lot. I spent a lot of time on flights. So I did. So we want to know in your trip out while we play a blog to watch, watches, watches, what did you see that had any watch content whatsoever? And then we'll ask the question, if a Breitling emergency had been put into the situation, would it have solved the problem and ended the movie early or any other ridiculous <laughs> watch for that matter? <laughs> okay, so I, I actually got a lot of watch content. I, I, I watched a lot of movies, but there were two prominent standouts. The first was that one, it's like secret headquarters. It's like Owen Wilson and some kids. He basically has some alien superpower and is like a superhero and his like high schooler age kid or whatever finds it in his the, his headquarters or whatever. Uh, not a great movie, not really my vibe, passed out halfway through it. But at one point I wake up and the um, – the 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 antagonist in the film is wearing an urwork that is like uh captured by some magnet thing and but you you see an urwork on the guy's wrist so that's uh got to give big ups to that movie for featuring an urwork on like uh the it's like a defense contractor CEO guy so i think that you know very iron man vibes i think it su suited the part so well done there you good 2023 marks 25 years of Urwerk, a brand from Baumgartner and Fry with the ambition to challenge auteur lingerie with new ideas and modern technologies, making art that tells time. The CC1 King Cobra watch from Urwerk, released in 2009, breaks away from the brand's identifiable satellite complication and instead tells the time using two linear dials, one for jumping hours and another for retrograde minutes, with the styling clearly inspired by retro car speedometers. At the top of the case, the seconds are displayed on a spiral that lines with a gauge and also on a numerical disc. For more, search for Urwerk at blogtowatch.com or follow at Urwerk Geneva on Instagram. 
Uh, and the other one was Atomic Blonde, that Charlize Theron film. I, I hadn't watched it the first time around, got it on the plane. The whole part of that is like all the spies' names who are leaked are engraved on the parts of like a Karov book or a watch. So there's some chronograph where, you know, it's prominently featured throughout it as that's the thing that all of them are uh, trying to get throughout the film. So I had no idea. It just looked like a good film and uh, put it on after my... I don't know, 15th consecutive hour of flight throughout that day. So yeah, I got a lot of actually, actually a surprising amount of watch content on this trip to Geneva. And would a Breitling emergency have ruined any of those films to start off with? I think that watch would have ruined every single film, uh, if we're being totally honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean... The, scour the scourge of Hollywood is just the ability to instantly locate and call the emergency services to wherever you happen to be or hide behind it as a shield some of the the first generation <laughs> were quite large <laughs> good stuff david i'm assuming your flights and transport did not involve any in-flight movies no not at all but this way i had a beautiful view at the alps it was fantastic oh my god and the views up there were just 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 amazing to really uh, allow me to zone out a little bit after this long week well, we're approaching the end of a show, but I am going to get you to name the watch you would most have wanted to take home amongst all the watches that you saw in the past week. So Ripley, let's start with you. What would have been your take home from the week? Oh, I mean, blank check, you know, you can't sell it. It's just got to be yours to keep and fondle and wear forever. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and take that art time piece. I mean, there's only 20 of them made. It's got a six-figure price tag attached to it. Y yeah, why, why not? If it, You know, it, it, as long as we're playing with uh, funny money here, yeah, let, I'll go ahead and get one of those for myself. And you've got some Bergeron watchmaking tools at home. You can always remove the logo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think they'll be more than accommodating if I'm if I'm buying one of the twenty pieces. I can I can get my face or my dog's head or something on put there instead. <laughs> <laughs> David, your one take home from the week? Buy more watches, that's all. And buy the watches you <laughs> like, because that way you keep good brands in business and uh, keep the creativity up, hopefully. Okay, David, I realize that Ariel is not here and that you feel the urgent need to channel his inability to answer a simple question when asked to name a watch to actually, you know, oh, name a watch. Oh, it was to ask a watch. But how about, huh. how about you name a watch that you would like to buy in the spirit with which Ripley has just done so mm. <laughs> and which I will follow you with? <laughs> mm. Not easy. Uh, oh, which one? Okay, I'm scrolling through my pictures really, really fast and see what okay, catches. Okay, okay, let's do, let's do what they do in, like, counselling. So close your eyes. Okay. Just close your eyes. Put your feet flat on the floor. Yeah. Your hands on the desk. Okay. Take a couple of deep breaths. With your eyes shut, what watch are you seeing projected on the back of your eyelids? Uh, blue Ublo Sapphire. <laughs> yeah, I can't get it. It's just burned into my eyes. <laughs> and it's not because it's so pretty. It's just in there. <laughs> oh my god. Where do I find half a million? Maybe I can get a discount. Who knows? <laughs> maybe. So, well, maybe if you. I mean, what you do is you start by buying. What is the cheapest AP that you can buy? Oh, get That's out. a good question. <laughs> what, is, what actually is the cheapest AP that you can buy? So you start off by oh buying whatever the cheapest AP you can buy, and then code eleven fifty nine time and date and steel. Okay, so that what is that price at? But eighteen grand or something? I think it might Probably actually be more. a little bit less than that. Really? Okay, hmm. so so you get into your AP for fifteen grand. Then you wait. Uh, you you gotta be subtle about it. You wait maybe six nine months. Crime gets committed. You know it just happens. <laughs> so you get a second oh, AP. You're so screwed. You can trade that one in, and you know. Over the course of five or ten years, you work your way up to it. You might need to move address a couple of times, change your name by depot a couple of times just to, you know, keep under the radar mm. from the from the AP police. And then, you know, lo and behold, you've got your half a million pound uh, Uplo at the end of it. And then I sell all the rights to Netflix and we we, we, we turn this into a catch me if you can. Ah, <laughs> now you're work. talking. You see, that's where the real money is. Yes. The real money is not in the watches. The real money is in telling the stories about the watches. This story is about a watch blogger who had an AP stolen in every continent of the world. 
And then it's like basically <laughs> on his journey to a half a million dollar also fire Uplo, which is the most pointless exercise ever. Imagine you do all of this and you actually end up buying the freaking watch. <laughs> It does sound like the reverse. What was that movie where the guy just ate McDonald's for a month? It sounds it sounds a bit like the opposite of that. Super size me or something like that, isn't Super it? Super size me. Super size my watch. Super, Super size, size my... my watch collection. And then at the very the very last scene of the movie is me dropping that watch on the hard floor <laughs> and just, just shattering it a million pieces. That's, right. that's really sad. You, you, that's right. At, at this at the start of the movie, for no good reason the first scene is you walking out of your house and <laughs> narrowly missing the paper boy who cycles past you every morning mm. as he whips by and that happens every morning you narrowly miss until the first morning when you walk out with your rublo having scammed everybody to get this watch and in that particular moment you put it on it glints in the sun you've got a smile on your on your face you walk down the steps and the paper boy runs straight into you and <laughs> smashes the watch into a million pieces Fini. oh my god <laughs> fade to black the end fin <laughs> the end <laughs> uh, good stuff well my watch for the week uh, that i probably can't stop saying about i think the titanium yacht master is the one that is is burning into my eyelids hmm. so uh, i think uh, uh, yeah i think it's a sensible purchase the bland master as a bland, the bland master <laughs> okay thanks for ruining it the last is my favorite watch for about 30 seconds so till you ruined it with that clip <laughs> so the rolex bland master is the is the new name for mm. that watch well done david thank you very much <laughs> great that's our show for this week do check in next week you'll get to hear ariel's story about chanel unless he's been assassinated in the meantime mm. which is it's always possible yeah it's possible you know the french the french can be a bit like that sometimes it's so either cool. assassinated or stranded at heathrow due to british airways so it could be either <laughs> one <laughs> so tune in next week thank you ripley for joining us that was uh, most excellent if you'd like to communicate with the show then email podcast at a blog to watch.com. Ripley, where can people find you on the internet? Either at a blog to watch.com. I'm the only one named Ripley over there or uh, on Instagram at ripley.sellers. Excellent. Ripley has a dot. David has an underscore. Tell us all about it, David. Oh, well, I freaking love my underscore. It's a, it's, it's a thing. Um, it's abtw underscore David on Instagram. And of course, on a block to watch as David. I, I'm the only one called David. I like that line, Ripley, very much. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> and I'm the only one called Rick. However, you can find me at, at Rick TikTok on Instagram. Thank you very much for listening. Have a great week. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. Take care.